welcome back. And today I'm delighted to be joined by a national treasure, a sporting heroine. Broke world records, got medals galore, Olympics, world championships. Throwing this javelin all over the place back in the 80s, weren't you, Fatima? Yeah, I was. Okay, we've got Fatima Whitbread. But, um, I mean, the reason we've got Fatima here today is not only is she a sporting legend, somebody that I certainly grew up respecting and a great role model. I guess all these wonderful and brilliant things that you've done, Fatima, it didn't start out like that, did it? You no. know, early in life, you had a, a difficult start in life. Yeah. Can you just explain to GB News what, what happened? Definitely. I mean, Lee, for me, I mean, I was abandoned as a baby and some would say left to die uh, in a flat in London. And a neighbour heard this baby crying and didn't see anybody coming or going. So she called the, the police who banged the door down, rescued the baby. And then I was taken to hospital and spent the next six months there. Um, following that, um, Hackney Borough Council made me a ward of court and I ended up living in a series of children's homes for 14 years. So um, it was a pretty tough uh, life for a lot of these youngsters, as we know. There's a lot of uh, trauma that's uh, involved with um, abandonment, a sense of loss, you know, um, emotional disturbance, not always. Um, Did you feel cheated? Um, well, no. I mean, I, I was very lucky because let me tell you, I had an, uh, an auntie that worked in the children's home, a 72-hour lady called Auntie Ray, and she was my bright shining star because Auntie Ray would, uh, I'd always lay in bed and hide under the covers and wait for her to come and get me up and she would sort of tickle me and that's it's got my day started. She hu humanised us kids. And I can remember watching Auntie Ray. I'd gone up the staircase and I looked out the port window and I could hear her clip clopping up and down the road where she uh, uh, watched where she lived. And one day I collected all these daffodils around where the, the children's home was and I, I put them behind my back and I knocked on the door and when she op opened the door I presented them and I said, will you be my mummy please? And she said, ah, oh, fats, look, she said, come round the back, she said, let's have a cup of tea and a chat about this. And I thought, oh, I'm in trouble here, you know. But she sat me down and she taught me the, the biggest lesson that, I, that stayed with me to this day. She said, in fact, she said, I can't be mummy to you. She said, I have to be mummy to all these children. Yeah. She said, so, but here's the thing. I can't always be at the children's home, she said, where you are. She said, and you can be their mummy. She said, and giving, you will receive. And, and that, was, that stayed with me because I learned to swivel the lens looking outwardly and, and I didn't grow up feeling a victim. I felt in, that it was important for me to be the protector, the guardian and the mother for all these other young kids. So at five, I was, I was behaving in a way that was probably um, as a, a young mummy, you know, to these other children and helping them because they were emotionally disturbed. You know, and a lot of the time, these children find it hard to process uh, all these emotional traumas that they're going through. I mean, they get stuck in their mind, and that has scientifically been proven to kids that it, I really yeah. find it hard to study. So at some stage in your life, you turn to sport, which a lot yes. of people do. Yes, yeah, sport was my saviour. And in fact, it was through a netball match at the school. I was always um, captain of the, all the hockey, the netball, and, and the athletic teams. and. Um, I wanted to motivate my team. It was the last uh, match of the year. It was a league match for the cup. And it was going 11, 11, 12, 11, 12 all. And I was raising my voice, trying to motivate my, my team. And the whistle went and the umpire said, young lady, keep that noise down, otherwise you'll be off. And of course I thought, OK. And I st started getting involved with the game again. And it got closer, closer and closer to coming towards the end. And it was 12, 12, 13, 12, 14. And I started making this noise again. And of course, the umpire said, I've told you once before, you'll be off. And as I turned my back and started to mutter, her team captain, Donna, said to me, Fats, she's strict. She will send you off. Anyway, long story shortly, we won. Yay. Yeah. But it was the end of the uh, uh, netball season, the start of athletic season. I decided with my friend uh, in a children's home, uh, let's go to the uh, athletic club. I said, and see what we can see there. And as we went, it was about a five mile walk, we decided to pocket the money. I suppose we spent it on sweets. <laughs> as we got to the track, Alma went off to the sprinters and I saw this tall, blonde, good looking fella chucking what looked like a spear. So I walked over to the, to the runway and I started to pick up the javelin. And he said, no, 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 he said, you can't do that. And the shot book coach, Jack Grinney, said, you'll have to go and sit in the stand and wait for the javelin coach to come. So I was sitting there, 
as all young kids are in children's homes. They're pretty much survivors. And I was sort of toe-tapping, toe waiting to see who this coach was. And uh, Jack said to me, here she, here, this, here she comes. And the mini pulled in. And as this person walked across the infield, I did a double take. Ah, oh, no, it's that same woman on the, the umpire for the <laughs> netball match. And yeah. I, I just uh, was introduced by Jack. And, and she said, yes, I know who you are. She said, you're that Fatima, aren't you? She said, well, any of that kind of behavior you showed on the netball court, she said, we won't be having you here. And it, let me just tell you about this, Lee, because it was amazing. She, she had me right here. And she said to me, look, she said, after a few weeks, she said, you've got a little bit of talent. She said, why don't you ask mum and dad to come up? She said, and we can talk about getting a javelin and some boots and put you in a competition program. So I just sort of nod my head. And she said to Jack Grinney once, he's fat I've got a hearing problem. So Jack said, why is that? Well, every time I ask her about mum and dad coming up, she just nods her head. So Jack said, ah, don't you know, she lives in a children's home. And with that, the following week, she came up, she threw the boots down. She said, I've had a young lady that's retired. She said, these boots, they're probably two sizes too big for you. She said, stuff them with paper and they'll be all right. And I was, and she said, here's a javelin. And I was sort of like, nobody's, I mean, we had communal stuff in the yeah. children's home, you know, and the fact was, I mean, I was so excited. Nobody's ever given me anything. I was in a rush to try and get back to the children's home because it was summer season. And in the summertime, a lot of us kids, those that could go home had gone home. And those of us that were, were, didn't have mums and dads to go home too, we stayed in the children's home. And we had German students that came over to relieve the house yeah. parents. And I wanted to show Ingrid how I threw this javelin. So I said, Ingrid, come in the garden. Let me show you how I throw this javelin. And of course, it took me twice, two throws to get up to the end of the garden. And it stuck in a vegetable patch. I pulled it out, threw the potato off. And I said, now, nah, <laughs> move out of the way. I'm going to give it a really good throw. And of course, I did. And it went sh 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 right through the French windows. And Ingrid's standing there with her head in her hands. And she said, she said, oh, she said, you're going to be in trouble now with the house parents. I was always in trouble because I liked yeah. to protect the younger kids. Um, so I said, OK, fine, uh, let's stick it with some sellotape, we'll be fine. So Ingrid said, no, 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 no. Of course, I got a month's ban when they returned. And word got back to me at school through a netball uh, match that uh, I was going to be in trouble because Mrs Whitbread thought I'd bunked off with the javelin and the boots and sold them. I'm not interested anymore. So I thought, I can't have this. So I got up one morning, it was about two o'clock in the morning, I went down to the, to the lounge in the bureau, in the French bureau, and I, in my ignorance, I took out an airmail envelope and I said, Dear Mrs Whitbread, sorry I can't come to the track anymore to throw. I smashed the French window and I've got a month's ban. But one day I want to be the best javelin thrower in the world. And I stuck it down, I put Mrs Whitbread, ah oh yeah, St Chad's School. And I stuck it under my arm. The next day we went out, I, all of us kids, we used to have like a, a teaspoon of black strap molasses, which was uh -huh. awful as we went out the door. And I would hold it under my tongue. And when I got down the road, I'd spit it out. And I managed to find a post box, put the, the letter in. And within a couple of weeks, yeah. I heard, uh, I thought, oh, she couldn't have got it. But then I heard the house auntie saying, no, 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 she's been really naughty. She's not allowed up. But Mrs Whitbread must have been quite persistent because within a week, I was back at the track throwing again and then she asked me would I like to meet the family and I said yeah that would be lovely and and she had two sons my um, and and her husband John and the two boys were four and two so they were quite young and I was pretty good with kids so I mean it was lovely to play with them and then she asked me would I like to to stay a couple of weeks during the summer and I thought wow you know this is like unreal a family you know I've never been in this situation before, always in children's homes, like a lot of us kids that we find in children's homes today. Um, it, was a, it was a blessing because um, she then asked me, would I like to live with the, with the family? Oh. And the Whitbreads, you know, I be, became a Whitbread and, and that was the best thing that's ever happened to me. So look, Fatima, I mean, we're going to go to a break shortly, but I mean, this is fascinating. And I know, you know, we've got a couple of minutes left, but you, you sort of throw your life into nine to helping children in care. Yeah. You, you dedicate your life to this is wonderful yeah. work, what you're doing. But I mean, your story yeah. is absolutely incredible. I didn't know that story. Well, let me tell you, I'm now, see, this is my calling to yeah. help young children in the care system yeah. and teens. And we're looking to, we have a shortage of 9,000 foster carers yeah. and we're looking to 
try and get loving care and secure homes for these children. Yeah. I work with Action for Children. If you want to know more, go on the website, yeah. on their website. Yeah, we'll, we'll put those details on as well. You're now changing other people's lives and yes. uh, passing a little bit of your experience on to the young people's young in the care people. system. That's fantastic. That's Thank what you. that is. Come here, darling. Yeah. Well, look, now that's absolutely brilliant. I'm absolutely choking up here, but you know, that's a real person from a real background.